Amelia Mary Earhart was born on July 24, 1897 in Atchison, Kansas to the parents Amy Otis and Edwin Stanton Earhart. Her sister Muriel was born just two years later. Amelia and Muriel were raised mostly by their grandparents since their father's job as an attorney required the parents to travel often. In the summers when school was off, Amelia and her sister would go back to living with her parents. Amelia had a heart for adventure. She spent her time outdoors, riding imaginary horses, climbing trees, sledding, and even hunting. Even though her family found most of those too dangerous for the young girl. At 10 years old, Amelia visited the Iowa State Fair in Des Moines with her family. Here she saw her first ever aircraft and was intrigued that something so small could fly so far. But after her grandparents passed away, Amelia and Muriel lived with their parents full time and traveled with them. They lived in many new cities and attended new schools quite often. At school, she defied many of the traditional gender roles, playing basketball in her spare time and taking auto repair courses. She finally graduated from high school in 1916 in Chicago and went on to briefly attend college. She was excited about what was next to come. After the war, Amelia returned home to the United States and enrolled herself at Columbia University in New York as a pre-med student. She worked as a social worker for some time after and planned on working jobs like she did during her time in the war. But in California in 1920, Amelia finally took her first ever flight lesson from World War I pilot Frank Hawks, and from that moment on, her life would change. Amelia was hooked on airplanes. She was fascinated with their workings and began taking flying lessons on her days off. Amelia was the only female member of the local pilots association, and from day one was making headlines across the country. During a time when females were typically expected to stay home and care for their families and homes, Amelia was showing that women could be out in the world doing anything they wanted. Just one year later in January 1921, Amelia started flying lessons with a female flight instructor. Nita Snook was a well-known pilot and a woman Amelia looked up to greatly. To pay for the expensive lessons, Amelia worked as a filing clerk for the Los Angeles Telephone Company. Later that same year, she purchased her very first aircraft, a second-hand Kenner Airster. Amelia nicknamed her plane, the Canary. Amelia loved the Canary more than anything. The Canary was her motivation to continue flying lessons. She dreamt of taking herself across the world in it. Amelia passed her flight test in December 1921, finally earning her National Aeronautics Association license. This meant she can now participate in exhibitions by herself and take solo trips. Just two days after her certification, Amelia celebrated by participating in an exhibition event at the Sierra Air Dome in Pasadena, California. She was also doing flying stunts to raise money for the settlement house where she was working. For the next few months, Amelia lived in Boston. She flew when she could and wrote articles about flying for the local newspaper to make some money on the side. She was setting aviation records like no one else ever had. The first which happened in 1922 when Amelia became the first woman to fly solo above 14,000 feet. But for Amelia, this was just the beginning. With all the publicity behind her flights, Amelia became something of a celebrity. She was requested to be interviewed, was wanted for newspaper placements, and nearly everyone knew her name. Hearing of her grand success, a man by the name of George Palmer Putnam, a writer and adventurer, got a hold of Amelia. He wanted her to fly him across the Atlantic and back, which would make her the first woman ever to make that flight. This 20 hour and 40 minute flight would break records and it also set the two up to start a relationship. Amelia was a landmark for women in aviation. After placing third in the All Women's Air Derby in 1929, she helped to form the 99s, an international organization for the advancement of female pilots. She also designed clothing for female pilots with the 99s that were advertised in Vogue. Amelia wasn't satisfied with only achieving her dream, she needed to help others achieve theirs as well. In February 1931, Amelia and George married. George became her publicist so she could share more about her life, which was so different from the norm. As the years went on, she continued to break records. In 1932, Amelia became the first woman and second person ever to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. She departed from Newfoundland, Canada on May 20th in a red Lockheed Bega 5B and arrived in Londonderry, Northern Ireland the next day. 
Upon returning to the U.S., Amelia was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, a military decoration given to people who exemplify heroism or extraordinary achievement while participating in an aerial flight. Unsurprisingly, Amelia was also the first woman to ever achieve this honor. Later that year, Amelia took on even further adventures. She made her first solo, non-stop flight across the U.S. by a woman. Starting in Los Angeles, she flew 19 hours to Newark, New Jersey. She was also the first person to fly solo from Hawaii to the mainland U.S. By this point in her life, it was clear her career was on a fast track to the top. Amelia was a renowned lecturer at Purdue University, an avid flyer, and a fashion designer on top of it all. She was making a good living, enough for her and her husband to travel whenever they wanted to, and to live a life free of worries. She was an inspiration to women across the world, a light showing them that they could be whoever they wanted beyond the gender stereotypes. But at 39, Amelia was beginning to slow down. She wasn't trying to set crazy records anymore, or earn more medallions for her courage. She was just flying for herself now. She wanted it to just be enjoyable, and just do it for herself. She didn't enjoy the long trips anymore, and they took more out of her than they gave back. So Amelia decided just to take one more flight, and then settle down to spend the rest of her life on the ground. Amelia's last record-breaking flight would begin in Oakland, California. After the first leg to Miami, Amelia announced where her journey would take her. And to the surprise of everyone who followed her, it was no small flight. Amelia announced that her final flight would be to circle the entire globe. Amelia wanted to determine just how someone would react to being under some of the worst strain and fatigue in the air. She knew the journey would tire her, and there would be barriers along the way. But she was on a journey to see how she could overcome it. She took off on June 1, 1937, on an eastbound flight with her navigator, Fred Noonan. Amelia attempted her travels in a twin-engine Lockheed 10E Electra. The pair would fly east to Miami, then down to South America, across the Atlantic Ocean to Africa, and then to India, and then finally down to Southeast Asia. This will allow them to cross the entire globe in just a few stops. On June 29th, they reached Le New Guinea. They already had flown more than 22,000 miles at this point, but they still had another 7,000 miles to go before reaching Oakland, their next destination. After refueling and taking some time to rest, Amelia and Fred took off again on July 2nd, this time departing for Howland Island, a tiny island in the Pacific Ocean. This island would be their next chance to refuel. But those eagerly waiting a communication back home in America were never contacted by Amelia and Fred once reaching Howland Island. There was no radio contact, and no one saw them. In the blink of an eye, Amelia and Fred were gone. Amelia and Fred just had 2,556 miles left when the Coast Guards lost contact. They disappeared before they were supposed to reach the coast of Howland Island, and no one knew where they disappeared to. The pair was communicating with the Coast Guard ship before the plane suddenly lost contact, and even with efforts from the Coast Guard, there was nothing they could do to get it back. According to the Coast Guard, the last in-flight radio message from Earhart said, We are on line 157337. We are running on line north and south. The disappearance of Amelia's flight was a national tragedy. People back home in the U.S. were waiting to see her successfully navigate the worldwide journey, and when her plane was lost, chaos broke out in an attempt to find out where she was before it was too late. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt authorized a massive two-week search party for the pair. But the plane was never discovered. No bodies were found, no evidence pointing to where they suddenly dropped off to. To everyone on the outside, it was as if their plane just disappeared from the sky. No alarming calls to the Coast Guard, no alerts of anything going wrong. One second, Amelia was descending towards Howland Island, and the next, she was the world's biggest mystery. The search parties turned up no evidence. On July 19, 1937, Amelia and Fred were declared lost at sea. From this point on, the great search party that would last for decades would begin. Within the following week, more than 120 reports from across the world were brought forward with individuals claiming to have received messages from her before she disappeared. Out of all of them, just 57 were deemed credible enough to look into. Many of the rest were just hoaxes and people just trying to become famous off Amelia's tragedy. Even the genuine calls eventually were called hoaxes. Eighteen months after she disappeared in January of 1939, Amelia and Fred were both declared legally deceased. Theories have been tested, presented, 
and passed on for decades since the infamous disappearance of Amelia Earhart. But do any of them hold true, or are they ways of just trying to explain the unexplainable? Here are some of the most well-accepted theories of Amelia's disappearance, mixing with some of the more far-fetched ones. We'll start off with one of the more far-fetched theories. Alien Apprehension The first theory commonly tied to Amelia's disappearance is one without any supporting evidence. Rather, just a group of people who believe in a chance that, well, it could be real. Whether or not you believe in aliens, you might agree that Amelia's strange disappearance is something otherworldly. Some conspiracy theorists believe Amelia, while flying over the Pacific Ocean, made contact with aliens. This claim states that Amelia was taken on another planet, frozen by space species, and then used to conduct biological exams on the human race. But this baseless claim is just an example of how far-stretched the imagination reaches, especially when it comes to a mystery like Amelia's. Let's get into some more realistic theories and dive into where they came from. Theory 2 is Amelia was captured by the Japanese. One major theory that many still believe is that Amelia got lost while she was in the air and was unable to find her way to Howland Island, her next destination. Being turned around in the air, this theory alleges that Amelia instead turned north towards the Japanese-controlled Marshall Islands. Once they arrived, Amelia was captured by the Japanese and held hostage. This theory does have some possible substantial evidence behind it. Included in this are various claims from islanders at the time claiming to have seen the pair's execution on Marshall Islands, but fiscal evidence to support this has never been found. According to the Coast Guard as well, Amelia allegedly sent distress calls from the island for at least five consecutive nights, which were believed to be genuine at the time. But according to these sources, search planes and rescue teams arrived and found no evidence. They believed this is because Amelia was already executed and the plane was likely washed up by a tide already. There is also an infamous photo in the National Archives that shows a woman sitting on a dock with a man on Marshall Island somewhere between 1935 and 1938. Although some people believe this is her, there is no way to prove it. In 2017, investigators announced that it was a million in the photo, but other groups debunked this theory not long after. In fact, Japanese authorities have said there were no records of Amelia being in Japanese custody. They even offered assistance when her plane went off the radar and worked with Washington to provide the assistance wherever they could. They even allowed Westerners to search a closed off area of Marshall Islands that had previously been restricted. Some reports state her disappearance brought the two countries even closer together. And something to think about is not too long after this, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, which forced the US to join World War II. So I don't actually believe that this was a gesture to try to create peace. And if it was, then why turn around so quickly? With that being said, the theory around this is that Fred and Amelia didn't crash at all, but instead they landed safely on the Marshall Islands where they would then be captured. Uh, many groups and different opinions have alleged supporting evidence, but there's really no real evidence to prove this theory true. The third theory a lot of people believed is that Amelia didn't just disappear, but instead she was on a spy mission to document the inner workings of the Japanese while the two countries were on the brink of war. So instead of her being on a mission just to travel around the globe, um, she was following American orders to photograph military bases on Japanese islands. According to this theory, her plane was equipped with all sort of naval spy equipment to carry out this mission. This included a 16 to 18 inch wide holes in the sides for cameras. Uh, the key supporter of this theory is an author named Randall Brink, who uh, wrote a book called The Lost Star, The Search for Amelia Earhart. Claims he interviewed the technician who cut out the camera holes in the aircraft. Brink also added that he had seen documents obtained under the Freedom of Information Act, which proved that Amelia's final flight was in fact filled with state of the art military equipment. According to this theory, Amelia didn't stray from the route, but apparently was intending on heading to Japan, but not Howland Island. But once entering the Japanese territory, her plane was shot down and she would lose contact with the Coast Guards keeping track of her. This theory claims that Amelia was living a double life, using her famous flights to conduct underground business for the United States, 
Although there's little proof of this and only a few individuals have claimed to see the evidence, it's widely believed that this is possible at least. The next theory is kind of a blend of the previous two theories. This theory doesn't say that Amelia was lost or shot down, but rather that she's been in America under a new identity. This theory alleges that Amelia was working as an American spy. One of the major supporters of this theory is author W.C. Jameson, who claims that it was common knowledge that Amelia was within high-ranking intelligence circles and was involved in intelligence gathering operations. According to Jameson and other authors, Amelia allegedly survived a plane crash into the Marshall Islands and was taken prisoner by the Japanese, but instead of being held hostage or killed, she was given back to the United States. But since her cover was blown, the United States couldn't risk her identity as being a spy getting out, so Amelia was given a new name, new identity, and a new life to live. They let the public believe that she died while flying around the globe. Many believe that Amelia became Irene Bolum, a banker and plane enthusiast in the New Jersey area. Theorists believe that this is done with the help of President Roosevelt. And although there are many supporters of this theory that she survived through this secret identity, the theory of Amelia becoming Irene is simply false. Irene Bolum was a real lady, had a real job, a real life. This theory caused her life to change drastically. A normal day could no longer exist with the country believing that she was Amelia. Irene Bolum denied being Amelia and even sued for 1.5 million in damages. Critics of this theory pointed out that no government documents ever existed to support that Amelia was ever a U.S. spy in Roosevelt's documents or any Army or Navy intelligence files. Although Irene Bolum did portray a striking resemblance to Amelia, this long belief theory has since been debunked. Theory 5 is Nicomaroro Island Getaway. On to some more of the well-believed theories. Many people believe and still believe that Amelia was rerouted in a panic towards Nicomaroro Island, 350 miles south of Howland. This theory outlines that Amelia was too short on gas to finish the route she had originally planned. With the possibility that she had landed in the area, Navy planes flew over Nicomaroro Island just a week after Amelia's disappearance. What they allegedly found was evidence of her disappearance and someone living there. According to documents, on the island there was evidence of people living in the open, including of a bottle of Benedictine, an herbal liquor Amelia was known to carry, but still there was no evidence at all of an aircraft. On this island there were also alleged bones that were originally believed to belong to Amelia. Of this was a skull, an arm bone, and a leg bone. But some scientists at the time believed they belonged to a man of Fiji descent between the ages of 45 and 55. Researchers in 1998 who studied the bones believed that in fact they were Amelia's, or at least a woman of European descent and about Amelia's height. But these bones were later lost and no further analysis was done. Other evidence of this theory includes a group of people believed that Amelia and Fred lived on the island for some time before eventually passing away there. The group known as TIGHAR believed that the pair survived for days, possibly even weeks, relying on rain squalls for drinking water. Since 1998, the group has turned up pieces of anecdotal evidence in support of this hypothesis, including a piece of plexiglass that may have shattered from her aircraft window, a woman's shoe dating back to the 1930s, improvised tools that may have been used to survive on the island, a woman's cosmetic jar from the 1930s, and bones that appear to be of a human finger. So although this theory is widely believed, even to this day, the main issue is that no positively clear evidence of either Amelia or Fred or the plane has ever been located. The sixth and final theory we're going to talk about, and probably the most well-believed up until recently, is there was just an unfortunate crash. Theorists believe that her plane just crashed in the Pacific Ocean and unfortunately took her and Fred's life. This theory is endorsed by Amelia's great nephew, Brom Kleppner, and even the US government. Brom and his mother believe this simple theory. Even though there's no evidence, it is most likely the explanation of what happened that day. 
The U.S. government believes that a million Fred crashed into the Pacific Ocean in their attempt to reach Howland Island. Although search efforts have not found evidence of Amelia or the aircraft, it is generally believed that the wreckage lies beneath the waves approaching Howland Island or Nicomaroro Island. A slightly different version of this theory is presented by a group known as Project Blue Angel. This group believes that Amelia crashed near Buka Island, an island near Papua New Guinea, when they faced fuel concerns and didn't believe they would make it to Howland Island. The Project Blue Angel team has been investigating the crash off the coast of Buka Island for years and now is attempting to surface evidence that may support their theory. The Buka Island theory may have stemmed from the 2011 evidence where locals in Papua New Guinea claimed to have found parts of a wreckage from Amelia's crash near Buka Island. Papua New Guinea was Amelia's last stop before departing towards Howland Island, so if the fuel concerns were arising it might be possible she turned around and attempt to avoid a crash. Individual divers have claimed to find evidence, like two skulls in the cockpit, that they believe to belong to Amelia and Fred, but no analysis has been able to confirm it. In conclusion, Amelia's family believes that there is more to this story than just solving the puzzle. Amelia's life was much more interesting than her disappearance, says her great nephew Brom. They believed Amelia is an influence for everyone who wishes to chase their wildest dreams, and that what she did while she was alive was much more important than how her life ended. Amelia Earhart could not have foreseen the future, but she said before her flight that she hoped her legacy would continue to inspire others to take challenges. In her own words, flying may not be all plain sailing, but the fun is worth the price. Now we're going to go into actually what is found to happen to Amelia, because in 2019, they solved the puzzle. In 2019, the bones found on Nicomaru Island were declared likely Amelia's bones by forensic experts, one as far as going saying that they are 100% hers. Remember these bones were found in the 1940s and they were originally believed to be a man's. But in 2018 they believed that these could be Amelia's, and that's when they started testing and came up with their conclusion. It is now believed that her disappearance was an unfortunate plane crash. For a woman who inspired so many, it is tragic, yet a poetic way to go doing the thing she loved. One last food for thought. If these bones are truly Amelia's, then where are Fred's body and bones? I just want to thank you guys for watching our video on the disappearance of Amelia Earhart. We hope you had fun going through her life learning about this amazing woman. Hearing all the theories that were floating around surrounding her death and finding out what the most likely culprit was of her death. If you liked this video, it means so much to us if you liked, subscribed, and hit that bell icon. Your support is what's going to allow us to grow and build this channel. Let us know in the comment section below if there are any topics you want us to go over or what you thought about Amelia's case. We thank you for stopping by and hope to see you again soon. Cheers.